Hi there. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Madness. I can see that already. Uh, my name is Angela. I manage the test kitchen at Sunset Magazine in Oakland, California. Woohoo! Woo um, and I know that when I'm making a recipe, the ingredients and the process are key to success. So I want to talk to these professionals here about what are the ingredients and the process that are key to their brand or their identity out in the marketplace. So let me introduce you to our panel. Let's see, we have Ramon. He is the head brewer at Anchor Steam Brewery, or Anchor Brewery, I guess. I'm supposed to talk. And he, in partnership with Sean, who is the uh, CEO and founder of Revive Kombucha, made some beer that you're trying right now. We have Stephanie from Mellows, and she's also, Next Christmas, she'll have a cookbook for you. Mm. This is a cannabis yeah. uh, edibles company. Thank we, you. Yeah. Yay. And you have her goodies here with you today. Uh, Chris Cosentino, who is a cookbook author and a chef. Right now, let's see, brand new cookbook, Awful Good. Yep. Um, so you can understand why we need to and want to eat the whole animal, which I think is a wise thing. Two new restaurants. You know, he's... He's got a few things to say. We have Dan <laughs> here, who's the owner of Camp Navarro, and Woo! he's going to talk to us a little bit about Thank how you. that even happened. And we have Cliff, who's a surfer and a PhD student studying, and a food activist, and also knows a little bit about sunscreen. So um, I'm going to start by asking each of you to think about something we talked about before. Maybe Ramon will start with you. Could you tell just like that moment when you knew your first beer was a success or or maybe your last beer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what well, that felt like and what the process well, was. Well, success, you know, to me, every beer I make is successful. <laughs> it's got alcohol in it. It's <laughs> success right there. Um, but the thing is. You know, I started brewing beer when I was in college, and of course I thought I was making amazing beer, but in reality I was probably making pretty bad beer because I was I was basically using, like, the easy way to make these beers. I was buying the extracts. I was buying, you know, these kits and stuff that are, were already made, and and when you kind of move up and graduate into into this, like, home, home brewing stuff, sort of scene you're doing like all grain so you're creating it all bug in my eye <laughs> um so when i started doing all grain at my house i thought wow these beers are so much better and that's the control you have over your ingredients knowing your ingredient picking exactly what you want to use um for us at the brewery um, every brewery uses the same ingredients, you know, it's four ingredients to make beer, water, uh, malted grain, usually barley, hops and water, I mean in yeast, <laughs> too many waters. Uh, <laughs> so so those, those four ingredients are universal in the beer world, but it's how you treat them, it's what you do to them, it's understanding the science into what's actually happening when you're doing these processes, breaking down um, the starches by the enzymes. It's all these things that you can control that before I had no idea I could control. I was just like, oh, I read this book and this guy said slap this and this and this and boom, wait three weeks and there you go, you have beer. But that's in reality, that's not how it is. It's Although beer has been made for, you know, thousands of years, um, making the, the same beer over and over, that's the really hard part. And, and that's what your consumer wants. They want to they wanna pick up that beer and know that it's the same as the beer they had last week. And, and controlling ingredients that are changing with the, with the seasons, with the years, that's where you're kind of taking – proactive steps into understanding the actual ingredient instead of understanding the final product. So for me, that realization happened when I was home brewing. And then once I got started being professional, I was like, wow, I really didn't know anything. So for me, for me, I got to learn from some of the 
some of the guys have been doing it for 40 plus years and their understanding of these things is is amazing and being able to pick their brain for me was was the part where i was like wow i i love this industry i love the people who are who've been in it and uh, it's just it's amazing to work with just all sorts of people and i i don't know i love it well sean so uh, my question for you is similar of course but I know you started by selling your product at the farmer's market. Yeah. So when was that day or when was that moment when you said, this is great, people are, I'm taking the farmer's market because people are going to buy it. What was, the, how did you know, what was that moment? How did it feel? And also just even the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, I would say I didn't know it was going to work until the first person actually bought it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I think it's a similar experience. I mean, you know, you go, like I just bought homebrew stuff and, and started playing around in my garage. I think for me the ingredient piece was more about once we got into fermentation and I like took it serious and you know in my garage I set up like a refrigerated room where I could control temperature and really started tracking batches and being able to taste you start with such simple ingredients like you know tea and sugar and then like hours or days into it you're tasting all these new things Right. So it's like one ingredient is giving you 20 flavors mm -hmm. and realizing that like you have control over how you, you know, sort of manipulate that ingredient. Um, and what's interesting, I was just thinking when you when you were talking with Mona, it's like we've been using the same black tea since I was brewing in my garage. Wow. Right. Like we and yet like that same tea, we've been able to manipulate and and extract all these really cool flavors out of it. So. I think for me, you know, it was a. Re I came into this trying to reverse calculate into a flavor. So I had a vision in my head of what I wanted this to taste like, and then needed to go find ingredients that got me there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the experience of like exploring the ingredients, much like Ramon, you know, was saying, is like it really opens your mind to the p the potential of it, which really makes you appreciate like how important that simple ingredient is and everything that goes into it, right? Like the water that was used to grow that ingredient, the care that was taken for it. Like, you know, obviously we're big into organic. Um, it's, it, you can't uh, oversimplify, you can't overgeneralize just how important it is to get the right ingredient, you know? And it maybe you only need two or three to really make the right thing. So Stephanie, you have a special product, under the radar product, I guess for now. Um, <laughs> tell us, I'm thinking a couple things, you know, the first time you made it and you knew you hit it, but when you started adding other flavors, how did you decide, how did, you know, what was that process a little bit Sure, like? so wh one of my favorite things to do is, you know, I like to, to gift a box of mellows to someone and just watch their reaction, uh, not even when they taste it yet, but when they actually just open the box, because, I mean, it is like Christmas. I mean, it's the best reaction. You know, I wish I wish I could videotape it every time. You know, um, <laughs> build the ne your next feature is building little <laughs> right when you when you open it and it takes a picture of your face. Yeah, um, no, but I mean, it's just this pure delight, and um, you know, I think that 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 is something that you know I I saw. So when I was basically deciding which um, which you know staple six flavors to launch the product with I started out with maybe you know two dozen flavors and I had a big tasting party and just invited a, a ton of friends over <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah I mean I had a, l a lot of volunteers um, <laughs> but you know it was great I just I l just laid them all out and you know and kind of just got to see the reactions of you know what flavors people really gravitated towards and um, you know I think marshmallows is such a um, a fun kind of nostalgic and um, it's just a fun product, you know, so I really wanted to to start out with, you know, flavors that were really um, recognizable, you know, so we have like a strawberry shortcake flavor that was really inspired by, um, you know, those uh, those ice cream bars, you know, those old school. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so we take, um, you know, real strawberry puree and make the marshmallow out of that and flavor it, so it's a strawberry marshmallow, and then coat it with homemade shortbread crumbs and then I have bits of dehydrated strawberries in there. So it's beautiful and then it also is very, you know, flavor focused. Um, so, you know, we decided on those kind of our, our six standard ones that we thought just had really broad appeal. And then when it comes to, to adding on a kind of more exciting flavors like the mango ones that you guys all just got, you know, we um, 
every quarter I try to do a seasonal flavor. So that's kind of a place where I can have fun and, and experiment and, um, you know, push something out there that people may not know they want yet, but, um, you know, I – but I personally think it's great, and so it's just kind of like, here, what do you think about this, you know? And so we have fun with that, and, um, you know, standards, like, you know, we have a pumpkin spice coming out for October and a peppermint bark in December, you know? But um, but when it comes to flavor inspiration, though, I mean, I think a lot of it is just, um, I, I mean, I'm a great eater. <laughs> and so, you know, I just kind of find inspiration from, from dining out, and, um, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite ones is a, a raspberry rose lychee, uh, flavor and you know that's completely inspired by um, like a French macaron that I had once, um, and so you know you kind of just it's you know, it's part of it is just uh, creativity and inspiration and and then just transforming it into a marshmallow which is just a great blank slate for flavor. Great. So Chris, I'm trying to decide if I should ask you about your cookbook or your restaurant or a dish smile. that you love. <laughs> <laughs> so. Smile please. smile, please. So how did you know, when, when do you know the cookbook's done, everything in here it needs to be in here is in here, I'm sending it to my publisher. How do you know? You never know. You never know. Okay. Um, the book, start to finish, took 10 years. Um, it was a really big labor of love, but also every time we pitched it, somebody said no. Uh, nobody wanted to publish a book about guts. It was, in most minds, to publishers a disgusting subject and an interesting subject. Nobody really wanted to talk about whole animal ethic. So when the book was finished, all said and done, I felt like it was dead and old, to be really honest, uh, because it was, to me, it, it's, it's taken 10 years. Um, is the stuff in there old? No, but it is in my mind because I've reworked it and done it so many different times. Um, the goal for the project was to really capture the true essence and flavor of these cuts of meat, but also give an education to the public on how to, the whys, the what fors, what they look like, uh, because there is no information out there like that. The last book written in this style was done in 1976 by Richard Olney, which was called the Time Life Series. And they had terrines and pâtés, variety meats, fish, beef, pork, lamb. And there was no real book about how to cook offal properly other than that one book, which if you talk to any chef, they have that book and they have the pâtés and terrines book because it's all there was. But all the pictures were outdated. Mm -hmm. It was really not, it just really wasn't clear. So this was set up to be a tool for the next generation. Um, you know, there was a skip of generations with eating offal. So Time Life series came out. Um, you know, that was Richard Olney, uh, part of the New York Times. And they did that with Time Life. And I, I just wanted to make something that had lasting standing power. So that generation after generation knows that they can go. And these cuts of meat also won't vanish. The goal was to make something a tool for everybody. So first half of the book is the how-tos. And the second half is all the recipes. And the recipe sections are by animal and in the same direction that the front of the book is. It starts at the head and ends at the tail. And it has pictures of every organ, every cut from every different animal. And then when you go into the animal chapter, it's cow. Start with the head, end with the tail, and everything in between. So that was the ultimate goal. Um, I think we did it. I don't know. I mean, it's out there. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I think you did it. I think you did. We tried. Yeah. So, um, Dan, we've been talking about food, um, but you know there are other kinds of ingredients. Um, and there's also kind of the figurative ingredients. So I wonder if you could tell all of us about the moment you came here and you saw this place and said, "This is it, and this is what I'm going to do with it." Well, I had had um, a long time to think about, quote unquote, owning a camp. I grew up at camp for 15 years. I knew when I was 12 years old, I was going to spend my career in the outdoors and that somehow, someday I would own a camp. It just took me 40 years almost to suddenly get here. And in that time, I had a lot of experiences and uh, a number of careers that sort of um, gave me experiences. So I'll kind of sort of back up. So first of all, when I 
arrived here at Camp Navarro to look at the property, you know, it speaks for itself. We've done a ton of work. This was a, an old dilapidated Boy Scout camp, but it had incredible bones, right? The nature is gorgeous. There was infrastructure. The location close to the Bay Area was exactly what I was looking for. I had um, my two previous businesses were up near Yosemite. So I started my career as a mountain guide, adventure travel company. So I've been part of the outdoor industry for 30 years. So I, I come from an outdoor educator background. My love is to get people into nature. As I evolved my career, um, number one, I wanted to have more impact. I wanted to get more people into nature. Uh, excuse my French, the world's fairly fucked up. And people need to get connected to the earth and each other and uh, their place in the world. And so, you know, as a uh, wilderness guide in my 20s, I, uh, I had some of the most amazing experiences, but I also, um, I had this weird outlook on kind of how people should enjoy the outdoors. Uh, you know, I kind of poo-pooed people who rode in on horseback. You know, I would never tell them, but I was like, put a goddamn backpack on like we are and hike 10 miles and, you know, um, point was, you know, I've evolved. And <laughs> um, so my, my next business was a, uh, a resort hotel in Yosemite called the Evergreen Lodge. So some of you may have heard of it. So that was a way to merge my love of the outdoors, but I always wanted to own something. Every guide wants to have a lodge. Well, when you're a guide, you don't know how to do that. That's a pain in the butt. You got to raise money, blah, blah, blah. So I'd built up experiences. I also was really naive about hospitality, which was a great thing because what I know now is hospitality is, is you know, in the restaurant business or whatever. It's hard. I have 90 staff. I have 90 rooms. Uh, we're a founding B Corp, so we have a deep social purpose besides getting people into nature. But... I just wanted to scale my impact, but I was also evolving my career, and I knew I always wanted to own a camp, but I didn't want to be a hotelier again. So the idea here was to have events. I saw a huge demand for events at Evergreen and in general and sort of, you know, the lifestyle space and the festival space and the retreat space and the need for outdoor ed. So I took all of my experiences and, you know, put the sausage into the grinder and said a camp is a perfect asset to do that. But not every camp is set up like this. So the point is I've had 30 years, really 40, if you count my camp experiences to get to this place. And I'll, I'll end by saying the goal was to preserve the asset. My hotel in Yosemite was a historical asset that would have been scraped by a uh, a Hyatt or a Hilton to put a box in. This place, the Boy Scouts had 35 buyers that they didn't like or agree on. So we came along with this cool concept. They used the camp still. Point is, you know, it's it was a culmination, but, you know, this place speaks for itself. So um, I just had to kind of add in my experiences. So Cliff, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different, but we you have a lot to say about food and food activism and access to food, but just for the moment, just could you tell these people what it's like when you hit find that perfect wave? <laughs> <laughs> how do you know and how do you enjoy it? Malanui, aloha mai kako, e na ho aloha, e ka aina nahe nahe, o kapono ko i noa, O vai o kapono no hilo mai au. Aloha kako. Hello everybody. I'm Cliff. Uh, <laughs> thank you for listening to us on uh, the panel. Um, finding the perfect wave. I that's a I've never been asked that question before, <laughs> so I don't really have an answer to it. Um, but I think that's what maybe being a surfer is to many people is always trying to find that perfect wave, and once you find it, maybe you'll stop. So. Um, I haven't really found it yet. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you.
Um, so we've talked about ingredients. I'm going to go back to Sean for a second, um, and, but I think want all of you to think about this. You said you've been using the same tea and um, all these years um, and getting different things out of it. So, that, so I'm wondering, what do you do if a, an ingredient you love or you know is great isn't available? You know, how, yeah. You know, maybe Sean, maybe Chris can answer that. I'd like to hear from Chris too, but go ahead. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the teas, you know, hopefully what we'll do on that is actually secure a contract with the farm now that we've got scale, you know, so that we can preserve that. And that might involve us investing in that farm, providing assets to that farm way beyond what the fair trade taxes that we pay for that. But we had this experience with our coffee brew, Upbeat, when we went to go do that uh, brew, no one had ever done a commercial coffee only brew for kombucha. Um, and we didn't really want to go align ourselves with a particular coffee brand just based on brand or style, right? It really wanted to be about the ingredient and that whoever was roasting that was sourcing it, you know, direct from farm in the most ethical way. So we went out and picked 40 third wave, you know, coffee beans to go choose from. Uh, and we ended up just randomly on Blue Bottle when we released that in, in 2013. I didn't even have permission from James, the owner of Blue Bottle, until the moment the trucks were like going to the store. Um, <laughs> because we knew we wasn't on the label, it was just in the back in the ingredient panel. We didn't care, like it was just, we're sourcing it from Blue Bottle. And, um, it is a funny story. Yeah. It's hysterical, yeah. I know James yeah. really well. Yeah, no, I mean, yes. he, they just weren't, I couldn't get answers from them. We didn't have a choice. Like, Whole Foods was expecting it and all the indies. And so literally, like, the distributors got the trucks going to the store that morning, right? And I get a call from James. He's like, all right, it's cool to use it. I'm like, well, that's good. Thanks. Um, um, but he made a choice to go um, to totally retail, and they stopped all their wholesale operations. So that was a big moment. And, you know, Matt and Clay and uh, – we all just like scratching our heads, like what the hell are we gonna do, right? Like this was the perfect bean, right? Like we had found it, we had found this roast, this blend, it was just amazing. And it wasn't what you tasted when you brewed it, it wasn't what you tasted, you know, like when you were just smell, like it just uh, was all about what it would do in fermentation. Yeah. That was what was amazing about that <laughs> blend and that roast. And so we basically started over <laughs> and, and we had to go out and just, go out to market and go figure this out. And we ended up now, we use Equator um, and they do that roast for us. Um, and we were able to find, you know, that same exact experience again. Um, I would say that, you know, probably that experience, much like m many challenges in life, right? It, like it made us better brewers, right? To, to, to have to go back out and do that again. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I welcome that experience. I mean, it does make you, maybe you lose sleep at night every once in a while when you're like, <laughs> you know, the, the certain farm isn't shipping you or <laughs> right? like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's actually a really really valid you know the measure of our success is how we deal with problems right and I think in product whether it be pork whether it be a coffee bean whether it be a vegetable you know for me like with Bocalone we saw a huge variation in the pork between the summer and the winter the hogs lean out in the summer because it's hot. In the winter, they put on extra fat, so you have to change the way you're doing your product. You have to change it in according to the measurements to get everything right. But also, you know, like, for instance, I do a cider. I make a cider with virtue, and we just – it's different. Apples change every year. You know, the fermentation pro project change when you age, you know, cider in barrels and Britannomycin, it'll change it, Right. So what we've done is we did it in the same style, which is champagne style yeast in the style of Brittany, but we just call it awful good part due. So they're expecting something different. And I think with change and with products, I think I embrace it. I mean, I'll change my menu on a fucking moment's notice. I don't give a shit. Like if you're coming to the restaurant and expecting everything to be the same every time, then you're going to the wrong restaurant. That's McDonald's. You know, the same thing. One billion served. They served one billion pieces of shit to everybody out there. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to give someone a really wonderful experience of what's best at the time in the moment. And that's why I go to the farmer's market every week. I mean, I'm not, the restaurants aren't a, it's a different entity than what you guys are doing 
because for me, I don't, it's not a labeled product. At the restaurant, I can fluctuate. And if a farmer calls me and says, hey, dude, I got a bumper crop. I've got 300 pounds of peppers. How much will you take? I'll take all 300 pounds. And you guys will hate me because there'll be peppers on the menu for like a month, but they'll be pickled, they'll be preserved, they'll be, but that's, that's my job, is not only to give you guys the best experience of the season, but it's also to help my farmers survive. Like that's what I'm there for. I'm an intermediary between them to you. And if I try to stick to the same thing, it's like, perfect example, surf and turf, beef tenderloin, lobster tail, and asparagus. Do you want that 365 days a year? But there are people who do that. There are people who do that, and the asparagus is coming from Peru, Costa Rica, California, Mexico. It doesn't speak to who we are in a time, place, and moment. And I think that's a really important thing. So hopefully that answers. Any other, anyone else on that panel have any thoughts on that question? So, okay, Ramon, I'm going to ask, yeah, Dan, ask Dan. Go ahead. And you know about the food here, Tyler, where you're going. I'm, you know, originally our chef was going to sit in, so hopefully you're enjoying the food this weekend. It's, yeah, um, it's also challenging to serve high-quality food to 500 people, so I think he's uh, nailing it. But, you know, when, when you're serving at scale, as you said, like, besides what's available, a lot of times your distributors don't have what you need week to week, we cater to every event differently. We don't have standard menus. So we're not freezing anything. I have a, a walk-in freezer. My chef doesn't use it. Ice cream. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Store ice in it. <laughs> Point is, we have to um, build distributors. We have farmers. We have our own greenhouse. I don't know if anyone's seen it up there, but That's cool. we're trying now to obviously have stability by having it in-house, but the point is, as Chris said, change is really good, and you build adversity and character, and you know, so we've, uh, we've had to be pretty resilient at this business, so. I think you also build your team, too. Yeah. And yeah. to me, that's, that's the most. That's an ingredient, too. You know, your Absolutely. team is the most important thing in what you do every day, and if I can put education into my staff by changing the menu on a moment's notice, I, I just give them a prep list. I'm like, here you go. Make sure you have all these today. And they're like, well, what, what? Don't prep this. Prep this instead. Like, what are you doing? You'll see. 4.30, we'll put one up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it builds excitement, and it keeps them entertained, and it makes them feel like they're part of a process, and they're growing. Instead of feeling stagnant of doing beef tenderloin, yeah. asparagus, and lobster tail every day. Well, speaking of, of growing, Ramon, so you're at Anchor Brewing. That's a to me. That's a legacy product. It has. So, how do you, you know, honor the legacy, and introduce new things? How do you do that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, bring back Bach. Did I hear that? Oh, Hummy Nail. We're doing that for sure. Uh, um, yeah, you know, Anchor has such a storied tradition of being pretty much the first craft brewery. Um, and and doing everything really manually when anchor kind of came into there wasn't a craft beer industry they were the smallest brewery in the nation and so they didn't have equipment that was made uh for these small production lines so they would buy all these pretty much you know experimental lines that people would produce and be like hey yeah sure you could maybe do a hundred can't uh, bottles a minute with this thing. We usually make them for like 1,200 bottles a minute, but you know, well, this thing might work. And and so they bought all those things, and they didn't work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they en they they engineered them, re-engineered them to to work how they needed them to. And and if you go into the brewery, and I hope you guys all do, and um, if you're ever in the city. Please stop by. Um, drop this guy's name over here, Dane. Don't drop my name, though. They'll, they'll send you right out. <laughs> uh, but if you come by, you, you'll see it's super hands-on still. We don't have computer systems. Um, the beer's made by one guy. 
Um, I actually have nine brewers, but one guy's just on the brew at one time, and he's controlling, you know, 3,500 gallons of beer in one day. So there's a lot of beer. A lot of things can go wrong, and and for us to to uphold the tradition of guys like Mark Carpenter, who is pretty much the original like craft brewer out there, and and Fritz Maytag, um, for us it's it's upholding the tradition and and putting the the product first, not doing things the fast way. Um, always stuff goes wrong, and when stuff goes wrong that's when the artistry of, of the brewer comes through and, and do they want to take the time and the care to do it right? Because they could just be like, oh, I could do this like 20 minutes faster, get out of here, you know? But the fermentation would be slightly off, the temperature would be a little bit higher, you know? All these little factors matter. So for us, um, really caring about the product and having people that really put that product in front of themselves and um i know i i get joy from watching people drink a beer and a uh, beer that we made and and if they like it it's amazing to me and i hope you guys like that um beer that we made uh first time that we all tried it together i i, I hadn't tried it before sean hadn't tried it before um First time we made that style of beer is a Berliner Weiss. It's a, a kettle soured beer. So you could kind of taste that kind of um, almost yogurty kind of flavor because that's from the lactobacillus. There's like five different strains in there that we use to sour it. Um, and, and that style of beer is a traditional style of beer that's kind of fallen out of popularity. It's coming back now. And, and that's another thing how us at Anchor, we honor the brewing. We like to make traditional beers that they used to make 100 years ago or, you know, before Prohibition. And in those beers, they weren't technically the same style of beers that we're making today because we're more advanced in science. But the ideas that they had, the way that they used their ingredients, the way that they adapted to what they had, where they were at, um and that and that's what we still do uh we're in san francisco so we gotta adapt pretty much i just want to add on to what ramon's saying i think the ingredient that you're talking about is like the craft of like you know what anchor and and these craft beer brands did was it's the craft was actually this ingredient of discipline and routine right that exists in brewing and it's probably like the hardest thing i think everybody like appreciates a good craft beer but like the hardest thing is that these guys got to do that like every day every week every month right it just doesn't go away right so what brewers are doing is they can have fun with new ingredients and try new brews but the the ingredient they have to bring to the table every day is discipline right that love love yeah well, that's the discipline, I think, right? Like, you got to love what you're doing to have that much discipline. <laughs> it's waiting. I think the key is it's a, like same thing in salami practice. It's waiting for the final product to be finished. Mm -hmm. Being patient enough to wait. That's a really hard thing in a world of hospitality where it's instant gratification, right? You, you hand out your kombucha. Somebody drinks it. They smile. There's your instant gratification. The same thing with the beer. Same thing with the mellows, right? Same thing when you see people arrive here. Same thing on the wave, right? You get that instant gratification when you catch the, catch the wave. But personal, you have to wait to make it right. And that's the patience is the hardest part about hospitality. Making it right the first time. Getting it right. Same thing with cooks. Don't slam it out. Make it right. Make it nice or make it twice. It's the same thing. How much have you pitched? How many times have you guys pitched barrels of beer? A lot. <laughs> Honestly, tell, give them a number so people understand. I don't like to bring those things up. <laughs> okay, I'll, nice throw, I'll throw you a number. <laughs> I'll throw you a number. We've thrown away at Bocalone 8,000 pounds of finished product. Oh, that hurts. Yeah. And that was in one year. So when you take 8,000 pounds of finished product, multiply that times two, so that's 16,000 pounds of meat that didn't go right because I wouldn't let it go to market. And that's owning it, sucking up the mistake, and not sending out an inferior product to your customer. Yep. 
And it's the same thing. Everybody here does it. And that's a hard dollar to swallow. Oh, yeah. For the record, you should also wait with edibles. <laughs> Before you have your second one? Before you <laughs> have your second one. <laughs> the instant gratification. Yeah. Yeah. Do you let <laughs> <laughs> I'll be vigilant. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I'm going to ask Cliff a question that's a little bit different. Um, we are here in the Bay Area. We have access to so much good food um, and even so much bad food. It just accessibility is not an issue for us. I'm not, but you grew up on an island. How does that work? How do you, m how do you feed everybody on an island? How do you take care of just even the basics, making sure people get good food when they need it? Yeah, I think that's a good question that I think a lot of people in Hawaii today don't really ask themselves is where does my beef come from? And we don't have a slaughterhouse in Hawaii. So even if we have Hawaii raised cattle, it has to come to a slaughterhouse in the continental U.S. before it's shipped back. Think about, you know, the environmental impacts alone or the economic impacts alone. You know, I have my uncle, he grew up on a dairy farm. We only have one dairy left. So where's our milk coming from? You know, never mind the antibiotics and all those things. It's just where was the cow that produced that milk? It's like somewhere over there. I don't even know, you know, and that's you know, an interesting perspective to have. Um, we import up to 80 to 90% of all our goods and services, including food. So, you know, with a pop, you know, a lot of the economics say, oh, it's the population to supply, uh, support a population upwards of 1.1, 1.2 million people across the state, we need to import all these things, but traditionally, prior to first contact of Western people, we had a similar population which we sustained through the different traditional practices. Um, and we didn't have cow, or we didn't have um, the luxuries that um, many things are accessible now, which isn't a bad thing, um, but it necessarily isn't making it better. You know? So I think the real goal in Hawaii for a lot of people is to reduce the outside dependency, um, or at least have it a reciprocal contribution, where if we are importing all of this food, maybe we should be exporting out something as well, something that is valuable to the rest of the world. That way we don't become dependent and thereby you know, handicap ourselves. But that, that is a constant question that I ask myself mm -hmm. that not a lot of people are asking in their everyday life. Not to bring everyone down. Right? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be out there. I'm coming out in November. So I'm going to make sure I connect with you. Yeah, that'd be. Yeah, because I'm, I'm doing a dinner with Ed Kenny. Yeah. yeah. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> We're all going. You guys come Big Island. Big, no. Get a big bus, a big plane. No, bring food. That'll be great. <laughs> <We need it. laughs> what is the number one ingredient coming out of Hawaii, you think, that you guys are exporting? Hospitality. <laughs> Aloha. That's yeah. what we are. we're we're known for, and I think, and I think we, yeah. it sometimes gets taken advantage of because it's expected, mm -hmm. you know. And I think we have a lot more to contribute in terms of intellect, infrastructure, um, even methodology, mm -hmm. you know, that we can, you know, export out some things. One of the main staples of the Hawaiian people for a long time was taro, mm -hmm. you know, but taro is so expensive to cultivate and to process that. You know, I that's something that a lot of Hawaiian people we grew up eating, and that's something that we really have a cultural tie to. We even consider that plant a, a family member to our histories. But it's so expensive; it's upwards of ten dollars a pound. Mm -hmm. And you think about big families, Hawaiian families, and people can't necessarily afford this thing. So, you know, and people I've, I've heard people come to Hawaii and say it tastes like dirt. Like it doesn't taste good and things. I don't know if you guys tried poi before. It's like a purple mush. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's not for everyone. I understand that. But that's something that's very hard for us to eat. You know, something that's so important to us that we probably can do really good at cultivating. The rest of the world is like, oh, it tastes not so good. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly trying to think about what can we export, you know, and we're still trying to figure that out. Well, you know, you're so good at hospitality. I think you should have call centers should all be in Hawaii. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be great? Like you'd call and you'd be all freaked out about your credit card and they'd say mahalo and you'd be like. 
yeah. Let's get let's make that happen. <laughs> Who's here? Who can make that happen? <laughs> uh, let's see. I would like to ask you to think about. Um, so we've talked about hard ingredients. Um, just when it comes to ingredients that are new, how do you? Um, well, let me back up. I'm going to go backward. Ingredients. I'm thinking, especially on the packaged goods down here. These three at the end. Um, a lot of times, you know, we see the logo, we see the tagline in the ad. If you're a big company, but there's all this stuff on the back, and it's really clear to me that that the three of you, those little things are important. And sometimes they're going to be expensive, or they're going to be hard to find. How do you keep that true? How do you let the consumer know? How do you make those decisions when about those unseen things? How do you keep true to that? How about you, Stephanie? Why don't you start with you? So, so is the question, how do you, like, how do you educate the consumer? Yeah, educate. yeah educate them. Sure. So, I mean, I think for, with Mellows, I mean, we have a, a very specific product to educate people about. Um, and so, you know, it's, and, and we have all sorts of um, kind of hoops to jump through with regulation for, for cannabis. But, I mean, I think, I think one of the, yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Come. Um, but you know, I mean, I think it's a lot of it is is education. Um, you know, it's it's educating the consumer about um, dosage levels and um, and you know a lot of this stuff you you can't put in fine print on the back of the box and you know it has to be for I mean for us the way we've been handling it is is just really face to face. So um, you know we we really educate uh, our bud tenders. Um, so we sell it directly to dispensaries. And we see our bud tenders as our front line, you know, and so um, we make sure everyone has tasted them. Uh, we make sure they know how we make them by hand. Um, we know, you know, we make sure they know that we're, you know, what we're actually infusing it with. So, um, you know, we're not using um, like a chemical extract to extract the cannabis. We're actually using a whole plant hash. Um, it's being infused in coconut oil, you know, so it's more bioavailable. So this is all, you know, you, you really can't put that on the box. And right. so... You know, so we kind of, we use our um, our advocates, you know, and then we try to, you know, just sample as much as possible. I mean, I think tasting is really believing, so please taste today. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's important to know what you're working with, and um, um, and I think, you know, use your, use your advocates. Yeah, I, w I mean, interesting, labels is a huge part of our business, and uh, we've probably changed our label a dozen times, you know, for each of the brews. Um, I think what, what we've learned over the last seven, eight years is that ultimately you think you're telling the consumer a lot and they're really probably reading none of it. Um, and so a lot of the things that you think really matter potentially don't and other things that, you know, maybe because you're busy over doing this super crafty thing over here and you think everybody cares about that, you could be focusing on something over here that they really care about. For instance, we cold press all our juices in-house so we're sourcing fruit direct from the farm. It's a huge labor. It's a huge part of the brew house process to juice lemons, limes, cucumbers, ginger, the whole thing. And we think it really matters, right? We think it, we can control the quality of the ingredients coming in better, the finished product. We can adapt. We can get bricks levels from the farm. Um, but we're unsure if our consumers even know this. Are they reading it on the label? Do they understand? Do they really care? Uh, and could we you know, maybe buy a better quality product off the, sh you know, from a producer who does that better, you know, give up some of that, right, and then go focus in another area. Um, and all of that is a conversation about how we're communicating on the back of the panel, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but ultimately, I think that what drives us in all of that is what would we want to consume, right? So when I go into a grocery store and I don't shop that much, the first thing I do, and that's why I don't shop, is I turn the label and I read the ingredient panel. So it would take me like 12 hours to get through a grocery <laughs> store. Um, but, like, I don't think many people are doing that. I don't think a lot of people actually do that exercise of, like, doing the hand twist and reading what's on there. And, but for us, it, that matters, right? What we, want, you want, we want you to know that what you read is what you're consuming. And you can understand every ingredient you're consuming. Well, I just the thing I think is the risk, or maybe... I, so you have these wonderful juices. You have... There's that temptation, I would think, if you, especially as you're growing, to say, you know what, we could just use this shitty stuff over here, and it would cost us less, and we could still try to change. But then the, it does matter to your brand. I think the consumers, they don't know why they, they're like, uh, something's, so 
it is important, even if they're not reading the labels, right? Yeah, I mean, I think our belief is it's um, more of an evergreen approach, right? This idea that, um, you know, we're impacting. Everybody here has had our kombucha. It's incredible to watch and to see everybody experience it. But the reason people are coming back is obviously their body's telling them that they like this, right? That they're enjoying that experience. So, you know, that is why we do the juicing the way we do, because we believe that people are drinking it, they're feeling it, they're experiencing it, and they're going to keep wanting to come back to it. And that ultimately, if we did go buy some cheap pasteurized lemon juice, that you, that people yeah, right. would recognize that, right? That eventually, yeah. you know, um, but that's a tough decision to make when you're, when really most of what we're talking about business is you, you're driven by these financial factors that add a ton of pressures in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it does take a team and a committed group of, of brewers to sort of hold yourself accountable that like, no, 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 this is the best way to go do it, right? And we got to trust that long term, the consumers will get smart, they'll be educated, and they'll see ultimately what we're doing. Maybe eventually they'll be reading the label and really get it, you know? I, th I think, may, may I? I think, w especially with Bocalone, when we were in the process of building our salami company, we toured six or seven different salami factories to see how they do it large scale small scale and some of it was just eye-opening but um and i think for us you know knowing where our pork comes from seeing the farms visiting the people it's the same thing you guys are you know your farmers you know you're do you're doing your juicing you know it's the same thing with the pork i mean i i know they're treated right they're in hoop barns everything's proper and like I said, we see the difference in the pork in the summer and the winter. Mm -hmm. And it's consistently that way now. So we can prepare for it, just like you can prepare, prepare for variation during the year because you're dealing with the same people. But has pe have people come and said, well, why don't you just buy a commodity? Or why don't you just buy this? It, I just don't want to. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately what it boils down to. I don't want to because I know the final end means. I mean, some of the salami factories I saw were literally dropping – blocks of frozen pork shoulders i'm talking like 250 pound blocks of pork shoulders into grinders i was like are you fucking kidding me <laughs> like and people are buying it people are buying it at this i'm not going to tell you it was but we, people are yeah, buying we probably it we are you know because yeah. they just don't know and it's being dumped in with and literally another wheelbarrow comes in and dumps all the spice on top of it and it grinds it and spits it out the other side but like so then you're getting super waterlogged pork. It's going to take forever to dry properly. It's not going to cure right. Every time it's different. You don't have the right pH. So I think knowing what you're working with every time gives you the best final end means. Right. Yep. Cliff, you had something you wanted to oh, I was just going to say that. Or question. Yeah, it's just interesting to see how maybe how informed people are with the types of ingredients, what they even mean. You know, if you understand what a nitrate is or a sulfate or things like that, you know, these preservatives. And I can really appreciate um, the companies that take the time to try to educate the consumer, you know, whether it's this is what this means and this is what we don't use or this is why we use this. I think that really empowers the consumer to be able to know so they don't feel kind of like, what is that? Like, oh, it's probably bad or it's probably good, you know, because sometimes, you know, like niacin, it's vitamin C, but you hear it as niacin, you're kind of like, oh, it's like kind of weird. But these are the things that I think help help us as consumers to really be empowered and be a more conscious um, buyer. I think, Cliff, I'm still trying to understand what natural flavor is. Right? I read Does it. Does anybody on the back. know? No, I haven't been able to figure Maple it out. Maple syrup. Yeah. I thought it was MSG. I thought it was well, a new. I thought it was how you said uh, MSG when that's I was crack. Looking. Do you know what well, natural? Then you have, but then you have the nitrates, nitrates conversation, which is a pretty. I mean, I've been dealing with that for 15 years. It's a really heated debate. But what is uncured bacon? What does that mean? It means they use celery juice, which is full of nitrates. So they're using just celery juice instead of the chemical compound, so they can use 0.01%. Instead, does celery taste the same from one point of the year to the next? No. So it has different levels of nitrates as the year goes. So they use celery juice. So that's why when you go and buy a product that is uncured, it varies in style because it's never the same quantity of nitrates so this is a really heated debate that we deal with on a regular basis that i actually had to get harold mcgee involved with who's a one of the most celebrated food scientists i would say in the world uh, had to explain to all our staff and go through it but i mean that's a perfect 
point to what you're saying. It's a huge, huge heated debate. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to the type of food we're consuming. You know, like chips. We want a chips on a bag that's going to last for months in the shelf. Whereas, you know, the, what's the natural way of preserving things? You know, preserve meats or dried fish. You know, the drying process, the curing process is a natural way for thousands of years. We've, we've done this to our food. When you have something like jelly that lasts for a year or peanut butter that typically would only last for some weeks, you know, I, I think that's just a, a quick switch on the mind to think, oh, maybe I should question that or maybe learn a little bit more. Or, but it's really good when the, the companies do that. That's awesome. I appreciate it. So I think there's a happy hour brewing over there. And this has been so, these people are great. They have lots to say. I thought we might have a little Q&A, but I, I think we can move on over. But I hope you will seek all these people out and ask them more questions and, and, and enjoy this space here. So thank you so much for being part of this. This is great. Yep. Please grab Passed beer out. on your way out. Yeah, please. <laughs> Trying to get rid of that whole thing. Yeah, is that please. keg is too heavy to uh, carry down the hill. So drink. Feel free, drink, double drink. fists.